Address to a Haggis by Robert Burns Read for LibriVox.org by Gavin Christie August 2006, Aberdeen, Scotland Fair far your honest sonsy face, Great chieftain o' the puddin' race, Aboon the ma ye tak your place, Pinch tripe or therm, Weel are ye wordy o' a grace, as langs my arm. The groaning trencher there ye fill, Your hurdies like a distant hill, Your pin was helped to mend a mill In time o' need, While through your pores the dews distill Like amber bead. His knife see rustic labour dight, And cut you up with a ready slight, Trenching your gushing entrails bright like ony ditch and then oh what a glorious sight warm reeking wretch then horn for horn they stretch and strive till tack the hindmost on they drive till a ah, their wheel swilied kites belive are bent like drums then old guideman mist like to rive bethank it hum is there that hour his French ragout, or olio that would stow a sou, or fricassee would mak her spew wi perfect scunner? Looks down wi sneering scornful view on sick a dinner. Poor Dell see him o'er his trash, as fickles as withered rash, his spindle shank a good wit lash, his neve net. Through bloody field or field to dash, oh how unfit! But mark the rustic haggis fed, the trembling earth resounds his tread, clapping his wally neva bled, he'll mack it whistle, and legs and arms and hads will sned like taps a thristle. Ye powers wha mack mankind your care, and dish them out their bill of fare. Old Scotland once nae skink and wear that jopes in luggies. But if ye wish her grateful prayer, gear a huggies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ah, Are You Digging on My Grave? by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Wills of Silver Spring, Maryland on August 18, 2006 Ah, are you digging on my grave, my loved one planting rue? No, yesterday he went to wed, one of the brightest wealth is bred. It cannot hurt her now, he said, that I should not be true. Then who is digging on my grave, my nearest, dearest kin? Ah, no, they sit and think, what use, what good will planting flowers produce? No tendons of her mound can loose her spirit from death's gin. But someone digs upon my grave, my enemy prodding sly? Nay, when she heard you'd pass the gate that shuts on all flesh soon or late, she thought you no more worth her hate, and cares not where you lie. Then who is digging on my grave? Say, since I have not guessed. Oh, it is I, my mistress dear, your little dog who still lives near, and much I hope my movements here have not disturbed your rest. Ah, yes, you dig upon my grave. Why flashed it not to me that one true heart was left behind? What feeling do we ever find to equal among humankind a dog's fidelity? Mistress, I dug upon your grave to bury a bone in case I should be hungry near this spot when passing on my daily trot. I'm sorry, but I quite forgot it was your resting place. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. 
Read by Glenn Hallstrom, a.k.a. Smokestack Jones. Smokestackjones at gmail.com A Sitting on a Gate by Lewis Carroll I'll tell thee everything I can. There's little to relate. I saw an aged aged man a-sitting on a gate. Who are you, aged man, I said, and how is it you live? And his answer trickled through my head like water through a sieve. He said, I look for butterflies that sleep among the wheat. I make them into mutton pies and sell them in the street. I sell them unto men, he said, who sail the stormy seas. And that's the way I get my bread to trifle, if you please. But I was thinking of a plan to dye one's whiskers green, and always use so large a fan that they could not be seen. So having no reply to give to what the old man said, I cried, Come, tell me how you live, and thumped him on the head. His accent's mild took up the tale. He said, I go my ways, and when I find a mountain rill, I set it in a blaze. And thence they make a stuff they call Roland's Massacre Oil. Yet two pence half penny is all they give me for my toil. But I was thinking of a way to feed oneself on batter, and go on from day to day, getting a little fatter. I shook him well from side to side until his face was blue. Come, tell me how you live, I cried, and what it is you do. He said, I hunt for haddock's eyes among the heather bright, and work them into waistcoat buttons in the silent night. And these I do not sell for gold, a cord or silvery shine, but for a cup a halfpenny that net will purchase nine. I sometimes dig for buttered rolls, or sit lime twigs for crabs. I sometimes search the grassy knolls for wheels of handsome cabs. And that's the way, he gave a wink, by which I get my wealth, and very gladly will I drink your honour's noble health. I heard him then, for I had just completed my design to keep the Manai bridge from rust by boiling it in wine. I thanked him much for telling me the way he got his wealth, but chiefly for his wish that he might drink my noble health. And now, if e'er by chance I put my fingers into glue, or madly squeeze a right hand foot into a left hand shoe, or if I drop upon my toe a very heavy weight, I weep, for it reminds me so of that old man I used to know, whose look was mild, whose speech was slow, whose hair was whiter than the snow, whose face was very like a crow, with eyes like cinders all aglow, who seemed distracted with his woe, who rocked his body to and fro, who muttered mumblingly low, as if his mouth were full of dough, who snorted like a buffalo, that summer evening long ago, a sitting on a gate. End of A Sitting on a Gate by Lewis Carroll Bed in Summer by Robert Louis Stevenson Read for LibriVox.org by Claire Cornelia In winter I get up at night And dress by yellow candlelight in summer quite the other way i have to go to bed by day i have to go to bed and see the birds still hopping on the tree or hear the grown-up people's feet still going past me in the street and does it not seem hard to you when all the sky is clear and blue and i should like so much to play to have to go to bed by day end of poem this recording is in the public domain this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. Recorded by Glenn Hallstrom, a.k.a. Smokestack Jones. Smokestackjones at gmail dot com. Casey at the Bat by Ernest Lawrence Thayer The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville line that day. The score stood 4-2, to two, but with one inning more to play. And then when Clooney died at first, and Barrows did the same, a pall-like silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to the hope which springs eternal into human breast. They thought, if only Casey but could get a whack at that, we put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a hoodoo and the latter was a cake. So upon that stricken multitude grim melancholy sat, for there seemed little chance of Casey getting at the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted, and men saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second, and Flynn hugged and died. 
Then from five thousand throats and more there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley. It rattled into Dell. It pounded on the mountain and recoiled upon the flat. For Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile at Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd would doubt t'was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. And when the riding pitcher ground a ball into his hip, defiance flashed in Casey's eyes, and a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered spear came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of a storm waves and a stirring and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire, shouted someone on the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him, had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult and bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the dun sphere flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Strike two! Fraud! cried the maddened thousands, and Echo answered, Fraud! But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grew stern and cold, they saw his muscles strain, and they knew that Casey wouldn't let the ball fly by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. End of Casey at the Bat by Ernest Lawrence Thayer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Definition of Love by Andrew Marvel My love is of a birth as rare, as tis for object strange and high. It was begotten by despair, upon impossibility. Magnanimous despair alone Could show me so divine a thing, Where feeble hope could ne'er have flown, But vainly flapped its tinsel wing. And yet I quickly might arrive Where my extended soul is fixed, But fate does iron wedges drive, And always crowds itself betwixt. For fate with jealous eye does see Two perfect loves, nor lets them close, their union would her ruin be, And her tyrannic power depose. And therefore her decrees of steel, Us as the distant poles have placed, Though love's whole world on us doth wheel, Not by themselves to be embraced, Unless the giddy heaven fall, And earth some new convulsion tear, And us to join the world should all Be cramped into a planisphere. As lines, so love's oblique may well Themselves in every angle greet, But ours, so truly parallel, Though infinite, can never meet. Therefore the love which us doth bind, But fate so enviously debars, Is the conjunction of the mind, And opposition of the stars. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If I Should Die by Ben King Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Gleona If I should die tonight, and you should come to my cold corpse and say, weeping and heartsick, 
over my lifeless clay, if I should die tonight, and you should come in deepest grief and woe, and say, Here's that ten dollars that I owe, I might arise in my large white cravat and say, What's that? If I should die tonight, and you should come to my cold corpse and kneel, clasping my dear to show the grief you feel, I say, if I should die tonight, and you should come to me, and there and then just even hint thou'd pay me that ten, I might arise the while, but I'd drop dead again. End of poem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ode on a Grecian Urn by John Keats. Read by Linda Wilcox. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, Thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvian historian, who cantest us express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme? What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape, of deities or mortals, or of both? In Tempe, or the dales of Arcady, what men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth beneath the trees, Thou canst not leave thy song, Nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, Though winning near to go, Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade. Though thou hast not thy bliss, For ever wilt thy love, and she be fair. Ah! Happy, happy boughs, that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu, and happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new, more happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting, forever young, all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowed and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what, Grinalter, O mysterious priest? Leadest thou that heifer lowing at the skies? and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed. What little town by river or seashore, or mountain built with peaceful citadel, is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can ever return. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude, With breed of marvel men and maidens overwrought, With forest branches and the trodden weed, Thou silent form, dost tease us out of thought, As doth eternity, when old age Shall this generation waste, thou shouldst remain, in mist of other world and ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, 
truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode on the death of a favorite cat drowned in a tub of goldfishes by Thomas Gray. Read for LibriVox.org by Heather Skeen. "'Twas on a lofty vase's side, where China's gayest art had died, the azure flowers that blow, demurest of the tabby kind, the pensive Salima reclined, gazed on the lake below. Her conscious tale her joy declared, the fair round face, the snowy beard, the velvet of her paws, her coat, that with the tortoise vies, her ears of jet and emerald eyes, she saw, and purred applause. Still had she gazed, but midst the tide two angel forms were seen to glide, the genie of the stream, their scaly armor's Tyrian hue, through richest purple to the view, betrayed a golden gleam. The hapless nymph with wonder saw a whisker first, and then a claw, with many an ardent wish. She stretched in vain to reach the prize. What female heart can gold despise? What cats averse to fish? Presumptuous maid, with looks intent, again she stretched, again she bent, nor knew the gulf between. Malignant fate sat by and smiled. The slippery verge her feet beguiled. She tumbled headlong in. Eight times emerging from the flood, she mewed to every watery god some speedy aid to send. No dolphin came, no near it stirred nor cruel Tom, nor Susan heard. A favorite has no friend. From hence ye beauties undeceived, no, one false step is ne'er retrieved, and be with caution bold. Not all that tempts your wandering eyes and heedless hearts is lawful prize, nor all that glisters gold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Peter Quince at the Clavier Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Drake 1. Just as my fingers on these keys make music, so the self-same sounds of my spirit make a music too. Music is feeling, then, not sound, and thus it is that what I feel here in this room desiring you, thinking of your blue shadowed silk, is music. It is like the strain waked in the elders by Susanna, of a green evening, clear and warm. She bathed in her still garden, while the red-eyed elders, watching, felt the bases of their being throb in witching chords, and their thin blood pulse pizzicati of Hosanna. 2. In the green water, clear and warm, Susanna lay. She searched the touch of springs, and found concealed imaginings. She sighed for so much melody. Upon the bank she stood in the cool of spent emotions. She felt among the leaves the dew of old devotions. She walked upon the grass, still quavering. The winds were like her maids, on timid feet, fetching her woven scarves, yet wavering. A breath upon her hand muted the night. She turned, a cymbal crashed, and roaring horns. 3. Soon, with a noise like tambourines, came her attendant Byzantines. They wondered why Susanna cried against the elders by her side. And as they whispered, the refrain was like a willow swept by rain. 
Anon their lamps' uplifted flame revealed Susanna and her shame. And then the simpering Byzantines fled with a noise like tambourines. 4. Beauty is momentary in the mind, a fitful tracing of a portal, but in the flesh it is immortal. The body dies, the body's beauty lives, so the evenings die in their green going, a wave interminably flowing. So gardens die, their meek breath scenting the cowl of winter, done repenting. So maidens die, to the auroral celebration of a maiden's chorale. Susanna's music touched the bawdy strings of those white elders, but escaping left only death's ironic scraping. Now, in its immortality, it plays on the clear viol of her memory and makes a constant sacrament of praise. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. Porphyria's Lover by Robert Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Wills of Silver Spring, Maryland on August 19, 2006 The rain set early tonight. The sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm tops down for spite and did its worst to vex the lake. I listened with heart fit to break. When glided in Porphyria, straight she shut the cold out and the storm, and kneeled and made the cheerless grate blaze up and all the cottage warm. Which done, she rose, and from her form withdrew the dripping cloak and shawl, and laid her soiled gloves by, untied her hat, and let the damp hair fall. At last she sat down by my side and called me. When no voice replied, she put her arm about my waist, and made her smooth white shoulder bare, and all her yellow hair displaced, and stooping made my cheek lie there, and spread o'er all her yellow hair, murmuring how she loved me, she too weak for all her heart's endeavour to set its struggling passion free from pride, and vainer ties to sever, and give herself to me for ever. But passion sometimes would prevail, nor could to-night's gay feast restrain a sudden thought of one so pale for love of her, and all in vain, so she was come through wind and rain. Be sure I looked up at her eyes, happy and proud, at last I knew Porphyria worshipped me. Surprise made my heart swell, and still it grew while I debated what to do. That moment she was mine, mine fair, perfectly pure and good. I found a thing to do, and all her hair in one long yellow string I wound, three times her little throat around, and strangled her. No pain felt she. I am quite sure she felt no pain. As a shut bud that holds a bee, I warily oped her lids, again laughed the blue eyes without a stain, and I untightened next the tress about her neck, her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss. I propped her head up as before, only this time my shoulder bore her head, which droops upon it still. The smiling, rosy little head, so glad it has its utmost will, that all it scorned at once is fled, and I its love am gained instead. Porphyria's love, she guessed not how, her darling one wish would be heard. And thus we sit together now, and all night long we have not stirred, and yet God has not said a word. End of poem. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. A Prayer for My Daughter by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Zachary Brewster Geis August 2006, Greenbelt, Maryland Once more the storm is howling, and half hid under this cradle hood and coverlid my child sleeps on. There is no obstacle but Gregory's wood and one bare hill whereby the haystack and roof-leveling wind, red on the Atlantic, can be stayed. And for an hour I have walked and prayed because of the great gloom that is in my mind. I have walked and prayed for this young child an hour, and heard the sea-wind scream upon the tower, and under the arches of the bridge, 
and scream in the elms above the flooded stream. Imagining, in excited reverie, that the future years had come, dancing to a frenzied drum out of the murderous innocence of the sea. May she be granted beauty, and yet not beauty to make a stranger's eye distraught, or hers before a looking-glass, for such being made beautiful overmuch, consider beauty a sufficient end, lose natural kindness, and maybe the heart-revealing intimacy that chooses right, and never find a friend. Helen, being chosen, found life flat and dull, and later had much trouble from a fool, while that great queen that rose out of the spray, being fatherless, could have her way, yet chose a bandy-legged smith for man. It's certain that fine women eat a crazy salad with their meat, whereby the horn of plenty is undone. In courtesy I'd have her chiefly learned, hearts are not had as a gift, but hearts are earned by those that are not entirely beautiful. Yet many that have played the fool for beauty's very self has charm made wise, and many a poor man that has roved, loved, and thought itself beloved, from a glad kindness cannot take his eyes. May she become a flourishing hidden tree that all her thoughts may like the linnet be, and have no business but dispensing round their magnanimities of sound, nor but in merriment begin a chase, nor but in merriment a quarrel. Oh, may she live like some green laurel rooted in one dear perpetual place. My mind, because the minds that I have loved, the sort of beauty that I have approved, prosper but little, has dried up of late, yet knows that to be choked with hate may well be of all evil chances chief. If there's no hatred in a mind, a salt and battery of the wind can never tear the linnet from the leaf. An intellectual hatred is the worst. So let her think opinions are accursed. Have I not seen the loveliest woman born out of the mouth of Plenty's horn, because her opinionated mind barter that horn and every good by quiet natures understood for an old bellows full of angry wind? Considering that, all hatred driven hence, the soul recovers radical innocence and learns at last that it is self-delighting, self-appeasing, self-affrighting, and that its own sweet will is heaven's will. She can, though every face should scowl and every windy quarter howl or every bellows burst, be happy still. And may her bridegroom bring her to a house where all's accustomed, ceremonious, for arrogance and hatred are the wares peddled in the thoroughfares. How but in custom and in ceremony are innocence and beauty born. Ceremony's a name for the rich horn, and custom for the spreading laurel tree. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Rainbow by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Olly my heart leaps up when I behold A rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began, So is it now I am a man, So be it when I shall grow old, Or let me die. The child is father of the man, I could wish my days to be, Bound each to each by natural piety. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Richard Corey by Edward Arlington Robinson Read for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Wills of Silver Spring, Maryland on August 18, 2006 Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from sole to crown, clean-favored and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked. But still he fluttered pulses when he said good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king, and admirably schooled in every grace. In fact, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the light, and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Strange Meeting by Wilfred Owen. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake. It seemed that out of battle I escaped down some profound, dull tunnel, long since scooped through caverns which titanic wars had groined. Yet also there was an encumbered sleeper's groan, too fast in sleep or death to be bestirred. And then, as I probed them, one sprang up and stared with piteous recognition in fixed eyes, lifting distressful hands as if to bless. And by his smile I knew that sullen hall. By his dead smile I knew we stood in hell. With a thousand pains that vision's face was grained, yet no blood reached there from the upper ground, and no guns whooped or down the flues made moan. Strange friend, I said, here is no cause to mourn. None, said the other, save the undone years, the hopelessness. Whatever hope is yours, was my hope also. I went hunting wild after the wildest beast in the world, which lies not calm in eyes or braided hair, but mocks the steady running of the hour. And if it grieves, grieves richlier than here. For of my glee might many men have laughed, and of my weeping something had been left which must now die. I mean the truth untold, the pity of war, the pity war distilled. Now men will go, content with what we spoiled, or discontent, boil bloody and be spilled. They will be swift with swiftness of the tigress. None will break ranks, though nations trek from progress. Courage was mine. And I had mystery. Wisdom was mine. And I had mastery to miss the march of this retreating world into vain citadels that are not walled. Then, when much blood had clogged their chariot wheels, I would go up and wash them from sweet wells. Even with truths that lie too deep for taint, I would have poured my spirit without stint. But not through wounds, not on the cess of war. Foreheads of men have bled where no wounds were. I am the enemy you killed, my friend. I know you in the dark, for so you frowned yesterday through me as you jabbed and killed. I parried, but my hands were loath and cold. Let us sleep now. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. Recording by Glenn Hallstrom, a.k.a. Smokestack Jones, smokestackjones at gmail.com, on August of 2006. Tommy, by Rudyard Kipling. I went into the public house to get upon a beer. The public he up and says, we serve no redcoats here. The girl behind the bar, they laughed and giggled fit to die. I ounce into the street again, and to myself says I, Oh, it's Tommy this, and Tommy that, and Tommy go away. But it's St. Kim, Mr. Atkins, when the band begins to play. The band begins to play, my boys, the band begins to play. Oh, it's thank you, Mr. Atkins, when the band begins to play. I went into a theatre, as sober as could be. They gave a drunk civilian room, but had none for me. They sent me to the gallery or round of music halls. But when it comes to fighting, Lord, they shoved me in the stalls. For it's Tommy this and Tommy that and Tommy wait outside. But it's special trade for Atkins when the troopers on a tide. 
The troop ship's on the tide, my boys. The troop ship's on the tide. Oh, it's special train for Atkins when the troop is on the tide. Yeah, it's making mock of uniforms to guard you while you sleep. It's cheaper than them uniforms, and they're starvation cheap. And hustling drunk sailors when they're going large a bit. It's five times better business than parading in full kit. And it's Tommy this and Tommy that and Tommy how's your soul. But it's thin red light of heroes when the drums begin to roll. When the drums begin to roll, my boys. When the drums begin to roll. Oh, it's thin red light of heroes when the drums begin to roll. We aren't no thin red heroes, nor we aren't no blackguards too. But single men in barracks, most remarkable like you. And sometimes our conduct isn't all your fancy paints. Why, well, single men in barracks don't grow into plaster saints. Well, it's Tommy this, and Tommy that, and Tommy fall behind. But please don't walk in front, sir, when there's trouble in the wind. When there's trouble in the wind, boys, when there's trouble in the wind. Oh, it's please walk to the front, sir, when there's trouble in the wind. You talk of better food for us, and schools, and fires, and all. We'll wait for extra rations if you treat us rational. Don't mess about the cookroom slops, but prove it to our face. The widow's uniform is not a soldier man's disgrace. For it's Tommy this and Tommy that and chuck him out, the brute. But it's saving of his country when the guns begin to shoot. And it's Tommy this and Tommy that and anything you please. And Tommy ain't no bloomin' fool. You bet that Tommy sees. End of Tommy by Roger Kipling. Ulysses and the Siren by Samuel Daniel, 1562-1619 Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake of Long Branch, New Jersey Siren Come, worthy Greek, Ulysses, come possess these shores with me. The winds and seas are troublesome, and here we may be free. Here may we sit and view their toil that travel in the deep, And joy the day in mirth the while, And spend the night in sleep. Ulysses Fair nymph, if fair or honor were to be attained with ease, Then would I come and rest me there, And leave such toils as these. But here it dwells, and here must I with danger seek it forth, to spend the time luxuriously becomes not men of worth. Siren Ulysses, oh, be not deceived with that unreal name. This honor is a thing conceived, and rests on others' fame, begotten only to molest our peace, and to beguile the best thing of our life, our rest, and give us up to toil. Ulysses, delicious nymph, suppose there were not honor nor report, yet manliness would scorn to wear the time in idle sport, for toil doth give a better touch to make us feel our joy, and ease finds tediousness as much as labor yields annoy. Siren then pleasure likewise seems the shore whereto tends all our toil, which you forego to make it more, and perish off the while. Who may disport them diversely, finding never tedious day? And ease may have variety, as well as actions may. Ulysses but natures of the noblest fame these toils and dangers please, and they take comfort in the same, as much as you in ease, and with the thought of actions past are recreated still when pleasure leaves a touch at last to show that it was ill. Siren That doth opinion only cause that's out of custom bred, which makes us more other laws than ever nature did. No widows wail for our delights, our sports are without blood, the world we see by warlike whites receives more hurt than good. 
Ulysses. But yet the state of things require these motions of unrest, and these great spirits of high desire seem born to turn them best, to purge the mischiefs that increase and all good order mar. For oft we see a wicked peace to be well changed for war. Siren. Well, well, Ulysses, then I see I shall not have thee here, and therefore I will come to thee and take my fortunes there. I must be one that cannot win, yet lost were I not won. For beauty hath created been to undo or be undone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Read by Kirsten Ferreri for LibriVox.org in August of 2006. It little profits that an idle king by this still hearth, among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed, and know not me. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those who love me and alone. On shore, and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea, I am become a name. For always roaming with a hungry heart much have I seen and known. Cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, Myself not least, but honoured of them all. And drunk delight of battle with my peers, Far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met, Yet all experience is an arch wherethrough gleams that untravelled world, Whose margin fades for ever and for ever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe were life, life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things, and vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself, and this grey spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star, beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave the sceptre and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfil this labour, by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people, and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centred in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness, and pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. He works his work, I mine. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail, There gloom the dark broad seas, My mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought, And thought with me, that ever with a frolic Welcome took the thunder and the sunshine, And opposed free hearts, free foreheads. You and I are old. Old age hath yet his honour and his toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end, Some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods, The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks, The long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, The deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order, Smite the sounding furrows, For my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset, And the baths of all the western stars, Until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down, it may be we shall touch the happy isles, And see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides, And though we are not now that strength Which in old days moved heaven and earth, That which we are, we are, One equal temper of heroic hearts, Made weak by time and fate, But strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, And not to yield. End of Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson Waiting by John Burroughs Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake Serene, I fold my hands and wait 
nor care for wind, nor tide, nor sea. I rave no more against time or fate, for lo, my own shall come to me. I stay my haste, I make delays, for what avails this eager pace? I stand amidst the eternal ways, and what is mine shall know my fate. Asleep, awake, by night or day, the friends I seek are seeking me. No wind can drive my bark astray, nor change the tide of destiny. What matter if I stand alone? I wait with joy the coming years. My heart shall reap where it hath sown, and garner up its fruits of tears. The waters know their own, and draw the brook that springs in yonder heights. So flow the good with equal law, unto the soul of pure delights. The stars come nightly to the sky, the tidal wave comes to the sea. Nor time, nor space, nor deep, nor high, can keep my own away from me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yak by Hilaire Belloc. Read by Linda Wilcox. As a friend to the children, commend me the yak you will find it exactly the thing it will carry and fetch you can ride on its back or lead it about with a string the tartar who dwells on the plains of tibet a desolate region of snow has for centuries made it a nursery pet and surely the tartar should know then tell your papa where the yak can be got and if he is awfully rich, he will buy you the creature, or else he will not. I cannot be positive which.